Welcome to The Digital Difference with Scott Gulliver and Oliver Moradi. Welcome everyone to the third episode of The Digital Difference podcast with me, Scott Gulliver and Oliver Moradi. How you doing, Ollie? Yeah, I'm not bad, Scott. How are you? Yeah, good. It's been great weather today. Been um, relaxing out in the garden, making the most of it. It's been um, been pretty good day as it goes. Absolutely, making the most of that COVID-19 weather, I guess. You've got to do what you can, right? Mm-hmm. So today we're going to be chatting about uh, what makes an effective learning framework for businesses. And this is obviously a topic close to your heart, Ollie, um, obviously with your background in learning. Yep, absolutely. And um, before we start, I just want to make it clear to everybody that um, this isn't going to go into exactly what framework or learning framework you should be using yourself. This is just going to be going around the core principles of an effective uh, learning framework. Um, it, it, if you ever considered creating one yourself or if you ever go into business where they ask you to come up with an idea for an effective learning framework. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So I just want to talk around... Um, the, what we're going to be talking about today. So it's going to be around the um, core principles that make a good framework, uh, the core learning principles, and then we're going to be talking about um, when it's time to use a digital resource. We're going to talk about how new technologies and business culture affect the learning framework. And finally, what I find most important is evaluations and how it's so important to adapt and evolve uh, a learning strategy using evaluations. Great. That sounds awesome. Let's dive into it. So you've prepared kind of a couple of points we can run through. Uh, So the first one you've got down is understanding the core principles. I think it's really important anytime you approach a learning strategy is to understand the core principles or understand core principles in general of how learning works. And first I would say is learn the business strategy. Any business you go into, you should really learn the business strategy first. I think it's it's key as soon as you go into that business, whether you go in as a contractor or you go as a permanent employee or you go in as a digital agency um, or you go in as just an agency, a learning agency. I think it's the first thing you need to do is learn the business strategy because you're always going to align your core uh, learning goals alongside of that. So that would be my my first key point. Um, for me, there's five key principles, and I, I find that every single company or business do use. So they are activities linked to real-world scenarios and projects. So that's not just making any learning um, in, that's unengaging for anybody that kind of bog standard. Scott, I'm sure you've seen it plenty of times when you've all done that e-learning, um, and it's just uh, around a random scenario that no one can really relate to. Yeah, you've got to make it specific, I guess. Exactly. It's really more about focusing on real life scenarios that people have actually experienced um, and real life projects that people have experienced as well. I think that's a core um, key principle for whenever you start uh, making a learning framework. Learner's ownership of learning activities. Um, that's, That's basically the learners taking a bit of responsibility over their own learning and kind of understanding their own learning activities, uh, what, what ticks for them. Activities shaped by learner abilities, well-being, interest, interest and experiences. Now, that's a bit, it's a bit like the previous point, but instead it's more around what activities they go to find to actually learn, like kind of understanding their learning, what's, what best suits their needs. And we're going to go into that a bit more detail in a bit. Um, with like learning needs analysis and stuff like that. However, with this with this core principle, it's the activities around that. So it's it's you know if you're a fireman, you're not going to go and do a project management course. You're going to go and do something that's a bit more around your experience and a bit more around your interest. So it's kind of finding what you what's specific to you yeah. and understanding that. Also, I, I said I say well being in that um, because a lot of companies focus on that. On, the, on your mental state and how you feel around certain types of learning. And, you know, it's not engaging if you find certain types of learning um, boring or it kind of gets you a bit down, um, sat, sat in front of a chair. So maybe, you know, some, some people learn in different ways. Some people want to be more active around it. So well-being in that sense. My next core principle would be, so learners are asked to consider other solutions and contexts, testing their own projects and adapting accordingly. Uh, this is more around 
a bit like again a bit like the key, the previous point it's got the key um principle of basically learners taking their own ownership but instead of looking at their own work looking at their previous work and their projects and basically having a look at other solutions um how how things worked did they work previously how they could have worked better so just kind of and then learning from that learning how you would do things better looking outside the box maybe next time there's a different way of doing things and then um reflecting and develop their own process of learning again it's a bit like the uh, previous point but it's a bit different in terms of reflecting on what you've done and developing your own process and developing you as a person and i think that's how most people learn in life really yeah, absolutely. So those sound like some pretty, um, pretty understandable principles, I guess. All right. So one thing you mentioned there, Riley, was that learners need to take ownership of their ability to soak up the material that you're putting out there. How easy is it to to influence that as someone who's designing the uh, the framework? Because I mean, that's one of the things I think that's often first thought of when you think of, of a learning framework is these often quite dry experiences going out and quite often not really seen as too important by the people that are supposed to be learning the most from them. Um, how would you be able to influence them like that as the person that's designing the, the program? Okay, so a key, po a key point I think that we can take away from this, especially as learning designers, if you, if, you wanna, if you wanna be a learning designer, is you're more of a marketing designer nowadays with learning. Um, and okay. your, your key approach when you're creating a learning framework is just a, is just as much marketing marketing your learning as it is about creating a, an effective learning so to answer that question scott to get people engaged it's all about marketing different types of learning um putting it down different social media channels within the business you know most businesses are using their own type of social media channels and their own type of communication channels so it's continuously promoting that learning in different ways and it's not just creating that one piece of learning we'll go into this a bit more detail it's creating multiple pieces of learning and kind of pulling the learner in more than pushing the learner on pushing the work onto the learner I can, right okay you might have experienced it quite a lot before scott in terms of i don't know with an lms for instance and we'll, again we'll go into this in more detail later help with you sit you sat there you'll get an email in your inbox saying you need to do your health and safety learning yeah and two days to go <laughs> exactly and you, you 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 can't be bothered with it to be honest with you let's be honest with you even me i'll even say it when i see that email at work or i've, I've seen that email and i just think oh another piece of e-learning <laughs> and to be honest with you that that's exactly what learning designers don't want so in terms so as learning designers now we see ourselves more as marketing managers <laughs> and uh, more of as a yeah. marketing executives as well as learning designers because we have to mark we have to sell the idea so it's more about again about pulling these people in more than pushing it on and to pull people in you have to create different types of content to and i said this in one of the key principles as well um about creating activities linked to real world scenarios and projects um that can again i'll go into this in more detail later on but that's also based around um creating content for different types of people so you know different different types of people will be drawn to different things some people will be comfortable doing e learning some people will be comfortable doing video so it's kind of it's kind of creating that content and pulling them into different channels um and making it as available as possible gotcha cool yeah so what you're saying is along, alongside having good content, I really like what you said about selling the idea, you know, kind of making it as easy as possible for people to, to pick up. Absolutely. Great. So the second point you've got then is know when it's time to use digital. Right. So with this one, I think people, people here learning and straight away they think digital. And it's not always what you, it's not, it's not always the best solution. And when, when you say the digital, you're talking about people learning through digital channels? 
it's, it's learning to digital and yeah, channels, yes, but it's not, as I mentioned before as well, it's marketing digital as well. So it's not just the learning digital side of things, it's using digital in, with the marketing side of things as well to sell okay. that idea. Gotcha. So I'm going to talk about digital in whole through a learning process and when to use it within, within for instance, a learning framework um, to make an effective learning framework. So digital is a good aid throughout the uh, delivery of learning and can support all formats of learning. Um, it is an, it should and always will be an essential aid of any framework. So I think that if you see any framework within any business, you're going to see some sort of mention of digital at some point. It's very, very unlikely that you'll go into any business nowadays and they aren't using digital. In fact, I can probably guarantee that they, they are definitely using digital. Um, so it's when, when is it a good time to use it? I mean, we talk about that and bes if, bes when you're creating bespoke content, um, for instance, for a wider audience, um, that's probably a good time to use things like e-learning. So a broad audience there, to, to, you just need to kind of fire out content to the whole team. Exactly, exactly. And it, it's, it's not always the most effective way of, of using it. However, it is an, an easy option sometimes and an easy way to get that content out to everybody. Um, we sure. usually, you'll usually find it with more regulatory types of learning and that will be part in any type of learning framework, you're gonna need e-learning um, to deliver to a wide audience. Now we know um, more recently, when e-learning first came out, um, it was the big thing. Everybody used it because it's a sort of it's an interactive digital piece of content. Um, yeah. But you know, it's not always effective, and e-learning isn't always the answer. And I say that because a lot of people now, Scott, if I ask you this question right now, have you ever skipped through your e-learning and not actually done it? If you just look for that next button. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't exactly. we all? Exactly. And I think, you know, that is a key point in, in any type of learning um, situation is that e-learning isn't the answer. And just by me asking you that question and you saying that, we know that for a fact. So it's not always perfect to use digital. Sometimes you have to look at a solution. And as learning designers now, we have to think, okay, well, well you know, e-learning isn't always working in, in that space. So what are we going to use instead? And now we have a range of digital channels we can use. There's a range of, um, of digital software that we can use, um, animation tools, I mean, online web apps. So, I mean, just to engage in the learning and uh, gain the learning, engage in learning, um, we don't always need to use um, e-learning. Where do you think like, things like classroom-based learning still fits into the picture nowadays? So with classroom-based learning, it's a bit more in-depth and it's with someone who needs a bit more back and forth with a, with a trainer or a learner. You won't get that with e-learning, you won't get that with digital learning. So even if you use yeah. diff different digital channels like interactive PDFs, for instance, or e-learning, or um, you create a website with a few random um, pop-ups and things like that, it's, it's still never going to be that one-to-one -one where you can ask any question, you can fire off each other, you can fire off other people. So that's where classroom learning comes in. And it is an important thing. And again, we'll go into this a bit more detail, but it comes under the 70-20-10 kind of um, learning framework, um, which, we'll, which I'll explain a bit more later. Um, but it, it's a bit more important when you need to learn a bit more in depth about something, you need to fire a few answers off somebody. I think okay. that, that is where also classroom learning training comes in because also with classroom training is it can give you that specific time to focus on learning um, and digital isn't always needed in that kind of situation. However, you'll probably find, and this is a key thing I want to also bring up is that you will find that digital is probably used in classroom learning as well in one way or another, even if it's not, um, as you would think in terms of creating e-learning or showing an e-learning thing or showing interactive PDF, you will maybe have some digital flashcards up there. Most people in classroom training now will have laptops or some kind of computer where they'll need to do a scenario based thing dependent on um, 
what the te- what the trainer is teaching at that day. So there will be digital there as well. My point of really with digital is it's always good as an aid, but it's not always good as a prime function of every type of learning. I guess with e-learning, it was probably it probably fits or people think it fits within and around people's time in, in the office and around their, their current work schedules. But I guess, as you say, the focus is really the one thing that probably suffers um, in a classroom. At least you are in a different place, forced to kind of do this thing for a certain period of time rather than rush it in or just get it in and around your other work when you might not be giving it the full attention it needs. Yeah, classroom learning is is really, like you said, it, well, like, and like I said before, it's really for that more direct focus. And then e-learning is more that kind of on the go learn on the go kind of digital learning that you can do whenever in your own time um and it also mm-hmm. so with digital it does expand that opportunity to learn on the go um right yep. you know you can learn anywhere with digital whereas classroom based it's very specific it has to be done on a day i don't know you could be ill that day so then it it becomes that kind of oh, like problem <laughs> um yeah. whereas you know um you know, and then, then you need to find a way to complete that learning. And then a trainer has to find a day where they do a one-on-one session with you. So it's not always the easiest way, like, way to do it. Yeah. Again, yeah. this is where digital can also come in because, you know, communication technologies, if you are, if you and a, a, a trainer are based in different locations and that trainer's come down for that one day, but you weren't available, now you can do it over, uh, for instance, Teams or zoom as we're doing in scott so you know it, there's those different things you can do but we'll talk a bit more about that later sure yeah cool the next point you've got then is about learning needs yeah learning needs is more around the lead as it says as it really says in, in the title the needs of the learner um yeah what what do they need and how do they need it and this is where i spoke earlier about 70 20 10 scott and i just want to elaborate on what 70 20 10 is so 70 20 10 is 70 percent of learning on a job so 70 percent of experience learning so i don't know if you're for instance you scott you're primarily a developer um it would be you sitting with another developer who has a who has skills in certain type of developing for instance um or has a new way of developing when is using a new piece of software and you want to learn that way. So he's kind of showing you how to do it over a period of two days and then you track it that way. So that's really set. That's really the 7% of the, of where you would be, you would be as a learner. The 20% is again, we mentioned it before is the classroom based learning. So it's having that one-on-one time with the, with the trainer and it's learning that kind of, training with the learner and then the 10% is your digital learning really so it's your e-learning it's your interactive pdfs it's your posters it's your word documents um it, it will be mostly in digital format i mean very very rarely you'll get a book nowadays to learn from that um but it's also that will also come and be your tests and things like that but yep. this is this is where the framework is really coming around this is what most learning companies and what most businesses are trying to follow this kind of um this kind of process of the 70 20 10 this kind of this framework uh it works well for most businesses and i think that if you ask anybody they would agree that they learn over doing things through experience i mean it's it's an old saying isn't it like you would take someone who has the experience over someone who's fresh out of uni or something like that you know because they know yeah. something straight away or someone who's fresh out of school who has learned everything about it but they've never done the job so it's sure. it's of course the the way that everybody wants to kind of follow is learning on the job and there's different ways of tracking that and again this is where going back to my point before when is it time to use digital this is a perfect time to use digital but not in a way that you think in terms of e-learning or in terms of interactive pdfs but in terms of tracking that learning tracking how to um to use that through things like an lms or through like a different digital hub or platform i was going to ask basically as a learning team obviously 70 percent of of learning coming from on the job you know how how do you go about structuring that as a team or tracking it as you say yeah absolutely and and that's and that is again through different learning hubs and the lms i mean for, for us me i've always ever used an lms and had the managers track that right okay so appraisals and that sort of thing 
exactly so you mean again when we spoke about this before about kind of marketing that idea it's more about sending communications out to managers and making sure that they are tracking that learning with their direct reports and making sure that they do do that and make sure they do that so having an lms for instance will allow them to do that and sending comms to continuously remind them to track that because otherwise there's no evidence that these people can do are, are learning and they are doing their, their 70 percent um again it gives the learner a bit more responsibility and it's going back to one of those key those core resp um, responsibilities that we spoke about earlier yeah that makes a lot of sense um and i guess obviously you said that the 70 20 10 makes sense for most businesses or at least as a starting point mm -hmm. Is it easy to see where that's not working and where you might need to adapt it for your business itself? Um, absolutely, it, it can be easy. I mean, I think it's very easy to look at that 10 and think that that is your core learning. Yeah. Um, I know I know a lot of businesses who start, who will start sort of a learning framework and think immediately it's all based around that 10. So I've known, I've, I've yeah. worked with a lot of people who have come in and said, right, we need to throw out an interactive PDF and then we need to throw out a, a piece of e-learning followed up by a, a couple of these Word documents. Then we need to do a test and then, you know, we'll do an evaluation after that. And I'm just, and you're thinking, well, that's 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, you know, where's the 70 in that? Where's the classroom learning on the 20? Yeah. Um, so instead of actually looking at that 70 and that 20, it's more that actually comes more around the 10. A lot of people surround themselves around the 10. And if you if you already want to do 10% of that learning coming through, through that channel as, as digital, then um, as like digital e-learning and digital um, through di different digital channels, then, and that's the problem that we're finding with looking at that is that is, is, the, is the learning engaging and it's not most of the time because it's only focusing around that 10 and people switch off. Right. It's not always the, the effective solution. It's not always using learning through different digital channels and using just digital and e-learning and PDFs and workbooks. People switch off. It's not engaging. So, you know, actually I find more people focus on the 10 than they do on the 70 and 20. Classroom learning is seen as kind of boring. So not a lot of people use it, but it is a very important part of learning. Um, so you know, but people don't ever really look at the 70 too much. People don't ever really look at the the 70 and think learning learning by doing and learning on the job, having that accountable freedom. People don't ever really look at that as learning in itself. And it really is an important part of learning because that's how everybody learns, really. I mean, you're not let's think of learning outside of a business, for instance. Um, you know, you go to, for, I'll use it as an example for me today. I did my gardening. Um you know, I was putting in fence posts, I've never done that before, but it's a learning experience and I did it learning by doing, and that's part of the 70. But would I have looked at that as learning? No, but if you actually look at it, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a super important part of it for sure. And I guess, I mean, I'm probably jumping ahead here looking at your other points that you've got down, <laughs> so forgive me for that, but I'm guessing that one of the most obvious ways to track whether the 70 20 10 breakdown that you've applied is, is working would be just to speak to the learners is that fair to say 100 percent, completely again we will talk about this later and i think and it, to answer you it's a really important part of of a learning framework and i'll go into it a bit more later but effectively what you're talking about is evaluating and talking to the learners about what their learning experiences are and for me, I think it is actually, if not one of the most important parts, the most important part of learning. Um, but we will talk about that a bit later. But yeah, no, absolutely. It's very, very important. Okay, cool. I think another really important point of, of learning needs as well is or knowing what a learner's needs are, is um, allowing the learners to find what best suits their needs. Okay. Um, with the learning, you'll, you'll always find that what's good for one person isn't good for another. And if you look back at school, when you went to school, something like that, when you went to a class, was there always something that wasn't engaging for you, but you found other people were engaged in? That's the same with everybody. And I think that this is a key point in businesses is to find, is to give the opportunity for every learner to have 
every opportunity, for instance, to, to learn in whatever way they want. So try and, again, we're using digital as try and push out as much of that different content as possible. With using that 70%, for instance, within the 70 20 10, allow the learner to go and learn in any way possible in terms of their experience, allow the learner to go on a classroom if they want to. So it's given the learner options, but it's always it's given the learner, learner the accountable freedom to go and find their way of learning and for their managers to use an LMS or a digital channel to kind of mark that down and for it to be tracked. Um, but it's always important for the learner to find what's best for them and what best suits their needs. And also, um, you know, and I think that follows on nicely with engaging with learners and what makes them tick. I mean, for me as a learner personally, I like to look at video. I don't like doing e-learning. I've designed plenty of e-learning. Um, I find a lot of it boring. You know, interactivity isn't the same. It doesn't have the same kick as I find video, but I find video does. So I like to primarily work within video. But however, I do know a lot, a lot of people who like e-learning. I know a lot of people who like to use gamification in e-learning and they get something out of it. Um, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of people who like to learn on the job. I'm also a big, big fan of learning on the job. I'm a big fan of that 70%. For, for me, I would stay away from classroom learning because it doesn't, it doesn't entice me at all. So again, it's just finding what makes them tick and what, what engages them. And I think it's all about that keyword engaging. The learner needs to be engaged. And I think that's a key part in any learning framework is to have that option for the learner to be engaged. Yeah, I'd, I mean, it sounds pretty daunting, I guess, for a learning team to have to create content in almost every uh, consumable format but am i right in saying that over time assuming that there's not too much turnover in in the team that as a learning as the learning provider you probably end up figuring out the formats that work best for most people absolutely and there will always be the um the standard learning that is most engaging and you'll find that most people react to a certain kind of thing so you know you with experience again you'll as a learning as a learning designer with experience you learn <laughs> That um, going that using certain types of digital and using certain um, solu- um, different types of solutions in with different learning works and it's most effective. So you know you know when to use that seventy percent. You know when to say okay, well we'll leave you to do that, and then you also know when it's time to kind of sometimes have to push that learning onto the learner because you know, there's no other way of doing it. You know no one no one wants to do health and safety learning, so that's when. For instance, you would push that e-learning out because it's just the best way of doing it. Um, and you'll find there's a lot of bespoke content out there that's, that's exactly the same. Okay, so the next topic you wanted to cover was aligning principles with the business culture. Yeah, and I think this is actually really important. Um, it does only really apply if you're creating your, your, a framework and you're not adopting one. Um, but you'll find that most frameworks if you go and join a business um, have or have been built around the culture um, or at least alongside the culture um, if you're building one from scratch learn the business culture learn what makes them tick I know for instance um, with Microsoft they had a culture before of just you know get things done kind of don't ask questions and then their new leader came in and he, and he actually took learning as one of their core principles and was just like you know we're, we're gonna we're gonna create this learning culture for instance of right. you know accountable accountable freedom but if someone does something wrong or if someone does, doesn't do something right where did it go wrong and key learns from that you know and then let's build let's not have a trouble you know and people started speaking up then so that they took again if we go back before they took that 70 percent. they really put it in there into their into their learning and it, it's and this is where you would build a good learning framework around that so straight away you know you now know that when you're building a learning framework and if you go into a company like microsoft who you want to have that kind of learning on the job asking people as many different questions as possible you, you want to work around that for instance that 70 percent. so you want to build your learning framework around that um and it's just ensuring that that framework supports those um, those business principles. So you're saying that it's not just building the business principles into the learning framework, but actually there's also scope to push learning into the business principles as well and the, the business culture. 
Absolutely, 100%. It's very, very important. And it, it needs to be embedded within the, within the business DNA, if you will. Yeah, and it strikes me actually that this is probably one of the reasons that training or learning can so often be ineffective. I guess if you're walking into a company as, as a new learning designer, for example, um, and you you can see that the engagement's low um, or the training that's been given just isn't being soaked up well enough. Maybe this is one of the key places that can be the reason why. Absolutely, 100%. And, you know, there might be a culture of, you know, there might be a culture, like I said, with Microsoft, for instance. And I know I keep going back to this because I really, I'm really fascinated with their turnaround uh, because they really didn't have a learning culture before. And then they, they all of a sudden brought this in as one of their, their key, their core principles within their business, with the core principles within their culture is to have this learning culture. Yeah. And straight away, it just turned everything around for them. And, you know, people are so much happier and their well-being even came up because, you know, they, they have that accountable freedom to learn and stuff like that. Um, so straight away, they started developing in a different way. Work became more productive. And it's just all because, you know, they changed their culture. So as a learning designer coming into a business like that, absolutely, you, you're going to want to you're going to want to start designing around that sort of area, designing how as a learning designer, you'll be more of a digital designer. So obviously you will create digital content that will aid these people in terms of maybe, I don't know, creating a, a learning hub and a learning experience platform with different types of content for these people to go to. Uh, maybe creating a social media platform, for instance, for these people to talk to each other and share their ideas and share their knowledge. So, you know, it's, it's really important to kind of align your principles with the business culture when you're creating that kind of framework yeah okay that's really interesting a lot of, i think a lot of what you've been talking about around ties in quite nicely with the agile kind of ways of working that a lot of companies are moving to anyway i wonder whether having learning embedded into the, the kind of core business itself might hopefully start just getting more and more common absolutely absolutely and i think it will all right, so the number five in your list then is uh, how new software and technologies impact learning frameworks. Absolutely, and this is really important as a learning designer. I think if you're going in as a learning designer or someone who's going to be creating any sort of learning framework, um, <clears throat> be prepared to change your learning framework continuously because, Scott, as you know, and as I work very well know, um, Digital is continuously evolving. Uh, there's new technologies, new software that's continuously coming out. Um, and with that, it gives you endless possibilities to do things in different ways. Um, and by doing things in different ways, it also gives you that different way of engaging with learners. So you're obviously gonna look at that and see how you can take that on board. Um, let's look, for example, at LXPs, learning hubs, social media platforms. What are LXPs? So LXPs are learning experience platforms. Okay. Learning experience platforms are more for the learner to go on and keyword in that is experience um, or learning experience is to kind of find their own way through learning. So it's not just about going on to it. I don't know if you have a learning management system, for instance, um, you'll go on, there'll be learning popped into your, um, into your inbox or into your, hub or your own section or your homepage and you know that's the learning for you yeah. to do learning experience platforms are more based around communicating with other people finding that learning that's good for you and actually giving you more control of your own learning okay um very they're becoming more and more popular than the standard um, learning management uh, systems they are implemented in many different companies alongside of learning management systems and it's just there again to give the learner a bit more control um, and it's there to kind of support that 70 and also support that 20 in some cases as well gotcha learning hubs are built more internally and they usually kind of combine that lxp and that lms experience um, okay. there'll be a face there'll be kind of the face of learning for the, for the company itself Whereas the LXPs and the LMSs are usually built by external companies that are brought in. Um, and then you'll have like social media platforms, things like YouTube, but a lot of the time people, um, companies or businesses will create their own and they will 
so you know you'll have a, your own kind of YouTube so you know a video on demand service or you'll have your own kind of like um, documents hub or something like that people kind of build those social media platforms you'll have your own kind of Twitter um, you have your own kind of Facebook you know that, that sort of thing and that's where people can go in there and share their, their ideas so I mean with that straight away that gives the learners I mean 10 years ago that none of that existed really so the learner didn't have that option to go in and have that 70 as much as it could they could have done um, I keep going back to that 70 20 10 because I think it's really key and really important for learners and it's what most businesses like I said before kind of operate around so again having that option to communicate with other people within different uh, within the business is um is vital and i think vital for learning and it just gives that other option for learners to become more engaged with their learning um we spoke about lms's already it's standard but now lms's have more functions and more features it's not just about going onto your lms and having something in your inbox now lms's are using using ai AI is a new big thing within technology and it's it's there to kind of read and assess you as a person, what makes you tick. Um, and then it will give you options. It can give you little nudges as to what learning you should be looking at and what you should be seeing. It can also tell you if you've been learning more effectively this day and how much downtime you can have for learning and things like that. It's very, very, AI is very, very complex within LMSs. And uh, it can really help that kind of learning experience, make it easy for the learner. I, I mean, a lot of the time I'm talking about all this technology being available, but a lot of people aren't tech savvy. So, yeah, sure. Um, you know, you have these LXPs, you have these learning hubs, you have these social media platforms. Um, but, you know, a lot of people get scared. You know, you've got all these, all these different digital platforms, you've got all these different digital outlets and tech channels that you can use. Um, what's the best one to use? How to use all of them? This is where the AI can get involved. This is where the LMS, which is what most people will use anyway and what most people will be trained to use, can really help bring, bring that learning to you and not make you feel like you're lost in the digital world, for instance. Um, this goes on nicely to things like virtual classrooms now where it kind of supports that that need for for the classroom training. I know, like I said before, where uh, you know you might miss a class right, as a face to face meeting, and you think, "Oh no, that, what can I do?" This is where digital can really support that now. So you can have these virtual classrooms where you create an environment for different people, where loads of different people go in in one space virtually, like like on a call or something mm -hmm. like that. But then you also have that digital element of things popping up on your screen people teaching you being a bit more interactive so yep. i mean it's again yep. 10 years ago that wouldn't have been possible but it is now so that completely gives you new options because not everybody has to be in the same space um communication technologies uh which is just really simple and access like simple things like uh teams for instance uh zoom makes everything so much easier now for just to communicate between one another ask questions you know you have team like with teams for instance you can create different teams you can join different teams from around the business ask different questions with different people gain that experience gain that knowledge from learning and i guess this factors in nicely to that 70 percent kind of on the job side exactly scott i mean you know let's let's use it as an example uh, within your role you as a developer you don't know how to do a bit of coding. I'm not saying that you do, but um, you're struggling with something. <laughs> and, you know, you, maybe there's a team within your business that, you know, all the developers are, are joined to, are, are involved in. And you can just go on that team's page, type in a question, and straight away you can get a response, a bit like Facebook, for instance. And um, immediately you can get a bit of help from someone. Then you can go offline, maybe have a, a direct message contact between that person you know you can bounce ideas back and forth off each other it just makes that communication between different colleagues around the business much easier and yeah. uh instead of going yeah. out and trying to find that person you know you, so it cuts time down straight away and just makes that learning process a lot easier as well it makes it it encourages that person encourages that learner to use what's best for them 
So you've said there's lots of channels we can now use in the modern age, which is great and obviously ex expanding all the time. Is the, is the content that's designed for these platforms fundamentally different from the, the content that we've generated for other channels in the past? Or is it just the way that people are consuming them that's different? Obviously, there'll be different content that we can use because with new technology, there becomes new boundaries. So, for instance, before, if I'm creating, let's, let's say I'm creating a piece of e-learning, before I would have had, with just a simple LMS, maybe a 25 megabyte limit, for instance, just to create that piece of learning. So straight away, you're limited as to what you can create. Say on a, on a new LMS with a new learning experience platform, um, now you can put video on different things, you know, um, that technology has developed, that new software has developed, that's giving you now a terabyte per piece of content. So straight away, that gives you so much more potential to build something brilliant um, and, you know, using different digital channels straight away. Um, with new technology, yep. obviously with networks developing. I mean, let's not, let's not just talk about software technology. Let's talk about the infrastructure and the network now. You know, you have things like 5G, for instance, um, and, you know, fiber optic broadband. I know that that's, uh, that's not obviously a new thing, but let's talk about 15 years ago when fiber optic wasn't around and the best thing you were probably, the best like sort of internet you began was 10 megabytes a second. And you as a 20,000, um, employee business is using that sort of bandwidth to communicate between one another. It's just not going to work. But now we have this massive infrastructure yeah. that we can rely on. So straight away, that gives you that, that just extends the boundaries and with that kind of new possibilities to create new content. Yeah, that makes sense. More interactive and, and more engaging, hopefully. Absolutely. Um, and I guess equally, as people start to work from home more, um, accessing a lot more of these tools digitally, or a lot more of these uh, learning frameworks digitally and potentially, as you say, on the mobile as well, especially with better networks coming along. Am I right in saying that the, the kind of shorter, snappier bits of content tend to work better in these situations? Absolutely, because now we can create different types of content and we can easily put that out to different to, uh, to people on, on different pieces of technology, for instance. So again, like you said before, with mobile phones, with laptops, most people have laptops nowadays. It's not a day of using desktops in the office anymore. Um, so that short and snappy learning is designed for people to learn on the go. Yeah. And again, it's very focused around that 10%, go back to that 70-20-10, uh, like we spoke before. Uh, it's very more focused around that 10%, that quick bite-sized learning. Um, no one wants to sit there and do an hour and 20 minutes on their phone. Your eyes are gonna... Um, <laughs> go blurry after 10, 15 minutes anyway. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's it's more, and also you, you switch off, don't you? So you want to create yeah. that bite-sized learning and you want to build content through as many different channels as possible to make it engaging. And with that, it's that's more of a blended learning approach. Okay, that makes sense. Great stuff. So I still have when I saw your next, um, your next point which hopefully goes without saying, but um, I'm sure that you've got it in for good reason, um, which is having a solid learning and development strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And this really allows the framework to be realistic. I mean, most, most companies when you join will have some sort of L&D strategy in place. If they don't, they need to get one in place um, because you need to know where you're going to be in say five, 10 years and you need to plan for that. Um, right. And with, and having a solid energy strategy is key to having a good learning framework because you know, your boundaries, you know, your limits. So let's take it as an example. Um, for the first two years, you know, you, you want to develop your LMS and your LX, um, your learning experience platform. You want to make, you want to build those and you want to get that implemented by year two say to year two to year four, you want to start getting um, out of that 10% and more into that 70%, giving the learners a bit more interactivity. And then by year five, you want to have that blended learning approach. You're using loads of different channels, for that learning, that 70% is thriving. Um, you know, and just having that solid L&D strategy. Um, you know, so it should really be built around, your L&D strategy should really be built around the core principles like we spoke about before. Um, the, the business strategy and the culture. 
So I know we've, we've mentioned all of those before, but that's really what the, the L&D strategy should be built around. Yeah. Um, just ensuring that. So this is more around for people who maybe have their own businesses or have gone into a business where they've asked them, you know, we're kind of a new business. We need to build an L&D strategy. We need to build a learning framework. You know, it needs to be a, there needs to be a solid L&D strategy and a solid learning and development plan in place. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's, um, and also with, with that comes in new developing new ways of learning. So it's not just using that e-learning that we talked about before. It's using that 70, 20, 10 approach. Um, yep. Kind of creating a realistic timeline within that, using that 70, 20, 10 approach. So like I said before, having that, that five-year plan, having that 10-year plan and, and ensuring that you're sticking to those milestones. Okay, cool. I mean, how high level is this strategy we're talking about as well? Um, how high level does it need to be? Because I, I, I guess there still needs to be some level of being able to adapt the content that you're delivering potentially based on kind of immediate needs. Absolutely. And I'm not, I'm not going to say that you need to follow that, but you need to follow that as, the, as a rule of book or anything like that. However, and like I said before, you need to adapt again with new software and technologies. I'm talking about a five-year plan. In five years, something new could come out, you know, I don't know. Um, virtual reality could become a, a huge thing all of a sudden. So, um, you know, you need to adapt your, you need to adapt your LD strategy to maybe focus a bit more around that. But it's just as more of a guide and having a solid LD strategy, knowing what you want to um, build what what you want your framework to look like what you want your learning and development um, department to look like and having a, a solid and clear goal within that within a certain time frame it's really important okay yeah that makes sense and, and looking ahead like you said yeah absolutely cool and um, yeah this takes us nicely into point seven there which is adapting with the evolving environment yeah, and you know, I just I just um, touched on this before, just a tiny bit. Um, but again, with the with the new technologies that come in, um, digital is continuously evolving, um, and it can help support learning and and evolving and in the environment around you. Do you is continuously evolving? So it's using yeah. it's you might have a frame i just spoke about just before you know having a solid energy strategy you might have had a plan in place within five years to start using that 70. um you know that's that could be used as a guide but it's how you're going to implement that 70 might change within that L D strategy so it is with digital constantly evolving around you that is probably the most that is probably the most fast paced evolving part of learning at the moment is the digital side of things and how digital can be used so you know it's adapting your framework to that. So yeah, it's also keeping up to date with um, different methodologies and, get, and getting the learners engaged. Um, with that, uh, with that, I kind of mean there's different ways of learning, how it's been, how it's evolving, different what, different methods of delivering that learning, and different sort of methodologies that are continuously coming in place to keeping those learners engaged. How often have you seen those types of methodologies change over time? Do they change? once a year is it type of thing you need to be constantly looking at or is it type of, is it a more gradual change than that it's not as fast paced as the digital side of things so for instance methodologies are actually that i've seen have changed is more around the digital side of learning and that's right with the 70 20 10 approach again i've personally for me i've seen that 10 really being focused on for a very, very long time, for a very long period of time. Um, it's just dumping out that that learning with, with and just getting people kind of, do you remember how I spoke before, Scott, about pushing that learning on people? Yep. Um, and it's now more into pulling them into what's best for them, allowing, allowing that learner to kind of engage in that learning themselves um, and, what, and giving them the accountable freedom for them to learn. Okay. And I think that, you know, that is the most important thing. I think that's the, that's the biggest thing I've seen change personally. Instead of having that pushing, it's more of that pulling them towards it. And it's, it's us as, as a design team and as, as designers of, um, of, of learning material, it's 
us adapting to that and now, like I said before, becoming more of a, um, a marketing consultant in that sense of trying to sell that work to people and, and spread the word of the different types of content that we can have that we have for these people, for these learners to come and find. Yeah, nice. That makes sense. A prime example of adapting to an evolving environment is something that we're actually all working in right now, Scott, and that's COVID-19. COVID-19 has had an, an impact on the world. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing. It's never been, it hasn't been seen in many, many lifetimes. Um, yeah. You know, since maybe the Spanish influenza. Um, but it's, it's having a huge impact now. And it's also very important for learning, I think, because a lot of people have a lot of downtime right now because a lot of projects have come to a halt. People aren't quite sure what to do. So right now, this is where learning is prime and people are looking to that different kind of con content. And, you know, you can't have that face-to-face -face learning. It's a lot harder to have that learning on the job with, you know, having that um, sitting down with a few people in a room, bouncing ideas off each other, learning through the experience of doing. It's a lot harder if you're not in an office or anything like that. So now it's, sure. it's key to, to rely on digital. And this is where, where is digital? This is going back to my point before of, when to use digital now you know this was if you're looking at your learning framework right now digital is a key part of this now it's a key part of everything that we need to to do to learn um because we're all going to be stuck in our homes for maybe say the next 12 months um and how are we going to learn we can learn through different types of technologies like teams um so like that kind of communication thing so you can have that face-to-face -face classroom you can have like those virtual classrooms that we talked about earlier um different types of bite-sized learning content i'm sure that can be downloaded onto your phone if you want to take a break and you want to go outside into your garden or something like that you can use it on your phone mm -hmm. if you have a laptop you can take that outside as well um you know so you have that that digital aspect of things teams like I said before, Teams can also be used not just for those virtual classrooms, but it can also be used for um, going back to that 70 again is just having those little team chats, bouncing ideas with one another, having those little calls with one another. You know, it's it's all relevant. So, you know, this is where digital is actually really more playing a part. And maybe people should be stopped if this is going to be more of a permanent thing going forward. People can start looking at their learning frameworks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you say, people working for companies are having to adapt pretty quickly to technology that's been around for a, for a fair while, but just hasn't been properly utilized um, or hasn't need to be. You know, it wouldn't be surprising to see video calls way beyond COVID-19 just becoming the norm now, um, just because of, of how on board everyone seems to be getting. And as you said before, I think utilizing some of those technologies are a great opportunity for learning. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's super important to now more than ever is to use these technologies because this is the only way we're going to be able to use that 70% effectively and learn from one another. Yeah, absolutely. And so for your final point then, Ollie, um, and you've mentioned this a few times, so I guess it's quite a key one, which is uh, evaluations are key for continual growth. Um, again, I, I think I said this before, Scott, and I think this is my, um, one of my favorite parts. I worked in a business um, for a few years before and Basically, one of the key things we realized was the learning that, that we're sending out a lot of digital learning and, you know, was it effective? I mean, we were looking at it and we were thinking, you know, we're not enthused by it. Many other people must not be enthused by it, you know. So we started evaluating every single piece of content we had, which I think is really important that you should do that with any content you have anyway, whether it's sat down with someone for five days learning on the job, whether it's in a classroom, whether it's digital. Yeah. It's always important to evaluate. So we sent out tons and tons of evaluations about, um, you know, we made it anonymous because obviously we want to make people to feel as comfortable as possible to tell us the truth. And the facts and things were astonishing as to how many people didn't find digital learning engaging or e-learning engaging um, and how many people didn't even bother looking at the learning when they had it put in their inbox and just kept pressing the next button. Yeah. I think the stats came out as 93% didn't find it engaging. Wow. 85% just clicked through and didn't even bother reading it. Um, and as a learning designer, 
gets you quite disheartened. So this is where we started looking into different channels of how we could deliver that learning and really start focusing last summer to 2010, really start focusing on giving that learner that um, accountability to learn for themselves. So, you know, we're implementing um, LXPs, implementing learning platforms and for us it was a key learn so we were learning about learning we were learning how to how to adapt and we we're adapting to that environment and it goes back to my point before you know and this is why evaluations are so important because it tells you what's going on it tells you are your learners engaged it tells you is your learning effective and for us it's telling us no so we had to then start putting out different learning into different channels using that bite-sized approach for different digital learning and using that that 70 for people to learn having people having the accountable freedom to use on LXP um, implementing AIs and since then the stats have become way down because you know we're not just sending out e-learning anymore we're not just sending out interactive PDFs anymore we've, we've got different digital channels that people can use and it's become very very effective yeah, got it. That, those are some pretty crazy stats you threw out at the start of that section. It's good to hear things have got better by the end. As you said, feedback's important. How how would you suggest people can go about embedding some of that into what they do? Because obviously feedback is one of those things that occasionally gets dropped in maybe once every half a year when things suddenly go bad. It's often when things go bad and we're looking for reasons why. Is there a better way to embed some of that process? Is it is it about doing this monthly and making sure the team um, have it is it is it at the end of a project uh, you know what are the best ways in your opinion i think the evaluations need to be embedded in everything that we do we need to make it part of our i said the core part of our dna um right okay so i, th I think the evaluation should continuously happen so you, like you said scott you just gave a few examples maybe after every meeting you know key learns from every meeting yeah. You know, what went well, what didn't, maybe we should do this differently next time. Maybe we should do that. We focused on this part. We focused on um, our presentation for maybe 40 minutes when we should have been focusing more of having a, a general chat, for instance, during that. So I think evaluations don't have to just come through a digital channel formally. Um, you know, they can, evaluations can come from just having a chat with a colleague after a meeting um evaluations can come from you know people call it um constructive criticism but you know let's yeah. call it, let's give it a new name let's just call it evaluation we evaluate everything that we do and um yeah. i think that it's it just needs to become the norm and that and evaluating having getting that feedback continuously i think in everything that we do is key um because it just helps you develop and it helps you grow especially through that process of um of learning of, of sending out learning yeah totally great so you've covered off some pretty core points there i think um ollie we've, we've covered a lot do you want to just give us a, a bit of a wrap up on that and just summarize what we've talked about today absolutely so it's understanding the core principles of the business um we spoke about it before um you know it's it's all about those core print principles are usually used in every sort of business. So, you know, how I've worded them, they may be worded in a different way, but they all fundamentally have the same message. Um, it's giving the learner the accountable freedom to learn in, with, on their own terms. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really important. It's finding what best suits their needs and what best suits, um, what type of learning best suits them. It's creating a learning environment that supports business strategy and culture. Again, going back to having that solid energy strategy that's, that's going to support your, uh, your business strategy, your culture, having that learning framework that's going to um, support that culture and support that strategy, aligning your principles towards that strategy and that culture as well. Yep. Um, and it's evaluating to grow, um, not just as a, a learner, but also as a learning designer or as a learning manager or as anybody who's building um, a learning framework. Sure. And um, it's using digital as an aid throughout. I really want to make that as a key point. Um, I said earlier, I think it was my second point, is when is the best use digital? I really wanted to go through all of these points before I said it. Using digital now more than ever is really important because it's a digital environment. It's a digital world that we're constantly using. We're really moving away from that day of using paper. And even if we are learning on the job, and I said about learning that 70%, most of the time we'll be using digital, whether you're just using digital through an LMS to track what you've been doing, 
or you're just using digital to to demonstrate something to someone else most of the time you will be using some form of some form of digital so it's just using it as an aid throughout the learning process great i think there's hopefully some uh, really useful points that people could take away and probably apply to their learning framework straight away hopefully um there are some longer term pieces in there but some really actionable points i think absolutely that's great well thanks ollie and thanks to all of you for listening today so unfortunately we're episode three now we're still uh, behind some of the admin bits which we're going to get sorted real soon i'm sure um that'll include our email address and, and some other bits like that but um for now keep an eye out we'll be uh, launching a new website soon which will have all the good information on it and our next episode will be out in two weeks keep an eye out for that one thanks as always and look forward to seeing you next time thanks very much cheers guys thanks for joining us today and we hope you've enjoyed the episode we wanted to let you know a little about our digital agency we design and build killer experiences and apps And we also put out a bunch of free content to help companies of all shapes and sizes. Head to fluffdigital.com to find out more. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to keep a lookout for the next episode coming real soon.